Okay, so we've talked about abstain, we've talked about maintain, now I want to talk about seek out pain. Okay, that sounds really strange, doesn't it? Like, why would I want to seek out pain? Well, it turns out, when we look at that pleasure-pain balance, that those gremlins are actually agnostic to the initial stimulus. We learned that when we press on the pleasure side by using highly reinforcing substances and behaviors, they will jump on the pain side and we'll have that hangover, that come down, that craving. But what if up front we intentionally press on the pain side of the balance? It turns out those gremlins will hop over to the pleasure side and we'll get our dopamine indirectly by paying for it up front. And this is potentially a very good way to get our dopamine because it never puts us in that state of craving and it's less vulnerable to the addiction vortex. This is things like exercise. It turns out that exercise is immediately toxic to cells. But as the body senses injury, it starts to upregulate feel-good neurotransmitters like dopamine, but also serotonin, norepinephrine, our endogenous opioid system, our endogenous cannabinoid system, so that we get that runner's high, right? We feel good afterwards. Other forms of mildly painful stimuli would be an ice-cold water bath, right? Or submersing our hands and our faces in an ice-cold sink. Again, that leads to gradually increasing levels of dopamine over the latter half of the activity. And then we know that dopamine levels remain elevated for hours afterwards before going back down to the baseline levels of dopamine firing. So we never go into that dopamine deficit state that creates the craving. This is a much better way in general of getting our dopamine by paying for it up front as long as we get the dose right, right? It has to be not too little, but also not too much. So for example, we're not talking about cutting on ourselves. Why do people cut? Because actually, initially, it does make them feel better. The body senses injury, it releases endogenous opioids and dopamine, it takes them out of their own heads and their own psychological suffering, and it feels better. But it's a very, very bad idea because it essentially breaks that pleasure-pain balance. Very quickly, we develop tolerance, it stops working, we need to cut more and deeper, so it's a terrible idea. So one of the ways that we intervene for cutting is actually to think of it like an addiction and to encourage our patients to abstain from cutting for four weeks and to let them know that initially it'll feel worse before it feels better, they'll have cravings to cut, but if they can just get to weeks three or four, they will start to feel better. And in many cases, when they're able to, they can get out of that vortex of craving to cut themselves. So when I talk about healthy and adaptive forms of pain, I'm talking about much more subtle forms that of course would vary across individuals. It is things like exercise, ice cold water immersion, but also anything that requires our sustained effortful engagement over time. For example, reading a difficult book or um, studying a foreign language or playing an instrument, or maybe if since COVID, we've gotten anxious about meeting people, forcing ourselves to go out and to meet people. Or maybe instead of ordering with the app, we actually go up and talk to the barista or talk to the server. In other words, a form of exposure therapy where we force ourselves to do things that make us uncomfortable, but we know we'll feel better afterwards. It turns out that things like prayer and meditation also increase dopamine in the brain's reward pathway, so it's also a potentially a healthy source of dopamine. In other words, what we want to do is abstain from our intoxicant for long enough for those gremlins to hop off, for homeostasis to be restored. And then we want to create a world within a world where we're self-binding so that we can maintain those gains. And then finally, we want to intentionally press on the pain side, not too much, not too little, but just enough to get those gremlins to go over to the pleasure side so that we can get our dopamine indirectly by paying for it up front. And these are the kinds of interventions and the kinds of things that we talk about, especially in early recovery, those first 30 to 60 to 90 days.
One of the questions that often comes up is, well, what if I'm addicted to food? I can't just stop eating. Or what if I'm addicted to technology and I have to be on my computer for work? Or I have to be on my computer for school? That is a great question. And what it means is that we, of course, can't stop eating, nor do we want to. And we can't necessarily totally disengage from the technology. So one of the techniques we use, which is borrowed from Gamblers Anonymous, is to create a bullseye with three rings. And in that center ring, we decide what is our addictive behavior or substance. So with food, it's often sugar or processed food. So that would go in the center. And the goal would be to abstain from sugar for 30 days. Then in the middle ring, we put our triggers. Remember, these are the reminders that we learned also give us a little jolt of dopamine, followed by a little mini dopamine deficit state that makes us crave. So it's also a good idea to avoid triggers. So that would be things like maybe not keeping junk food or sugary foods in the house. Maybe not going to parties where we know there's going to be a lot of sugary food, at least in those first 30 days. And that outer circle is okay. These are the things I need to avoid, but what can I approach? What are the things that are good for me that I can do? And with food, it might be really trying hard to eat in a healthy way. Maybe doing more home cooking with really rich, natural, healthy ingredients. Reinvesting in some new recipes. So you get the idea. When we're talking about dopamine fasting with a behavior that we can't and don't want to stop entirely, we use this bullseye.